Okay. Um, well, I started voice work uh, by doing uh, singing in jingles for commercials and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing characters for some uh, commercials. And that's where I started developing all these crazy voices and all these different sounds and everything. And uh, so when I, uh, I was also a DJ for a while at a radio station. So I did all kinds of crazy voices and stuff anyway. So when I moved to LA uh, in 86, um, I had what you call a good demo reel. Um, mm. A lot of stuff that I'd already done, which you kind of have to have if you want to get an agent. Right. So I came in and I knew some people because I moved out here because I was doing on camera stuff mostly. And I was also a stuntman. So I was an actor and a stuntman mostly. That's what brought me to California. But while I was here, um, I took a few uh, classes, voiceover classes. And uh, so a couple of um, well-known voiceover casting people heard my stuff. And the fact that I had a good demo reel already got me in the door. I got an agent. Um, and uh, so they started sending me out for auditions. The first thing that I ever booked was a, th a thing called, uh, oh, uh, God, what did they call it? Well, one of them was the 25th anniversary of Star Trek, the original right. cast. Yeah. So I got on that. And then, um, oh my God, there was the goofy little thing I did called, uh, I can't recall now. Of course, I'm a great interviewer because I, uh, I can't remember anything. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'll think of it in a bit. It's something like Booger castle or something i forget what it was some really goofy stupid thing but it was kind of fun and um, when you start in voiceover then you meet other people who also uh, work because you're you know working with other voice people right um back then if we did a group thing a lot of times we'd be actually in the room together and still we do that sometimes now too on series and things where you'll be in a big studio room and you'll right. be like five, four or five people, or six people all around. Back uh, then uh, I did a little thing, the legend of sleepy hollow with a bunch of people. And we had a, a mannequin. It looked like a half mannequin in the middle of the room and its ears had microphones and, uh, and its mouth and then one in the back of the head. And so literally they would place us around it so that as we recorded, you'd hear the voice from where we actually were. And when you listen back to it, you'd actually hear it like surround sound long, long time ago. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, I guess Booger, not Booger Man, something Booger was the first thing I did after the uh, Star Trek. And I did a lot of, just bounced around and started doing a lot of things originally, but they were small voices because nobody really knew me or anything. Right. Then as you make the connections, you do other stuff. And then I, um, all through the 90s, I guess the first long-running thing I got on was uh, a thing called Dynasty Warriors for computer games. Right. That I did that up until just a couple of years ago. And I was uh, Zhao Yun, uh, the kind of the face of the thing there for a long time. And uh, then I also got into anime. Right. And so yeah. with anime... Um, I was lucky. I also do uh, writing and directing. So mm -hmm. I got involved in a thing called Magic Knights Ray Earth, yep. which is way back. So I, uh, I did translations because uh, we get in the, the show each episode and we would um, have it in Japanese and then they would have the English translation. But I'd have to fit those words into the mouth movements mm -hmm. of the characters on, con on the screen. So I did a lot of that, and then I, because of that, I also got the lead role of, of the main lead role, a guy called Ferio. Right. But yeah. then I was also the second lead bad guy in Nova. So, yeah. <laughs> so I did that. It was, I love that little series. Actually, it was a lot of fun, and uh, it was it was a nice little series. But there was one episode where you have to be careful when you do voice stuff. My bad guy captured my good guy. And for one whole episode, it's me torturing me. So All right. <laughs> that, was, that was a little bizarre. 
so I was glad that uh, one of my voices was higher and one of my voices was deeper, you know, so it worked out great. You record one side of the voice and they play it in your head and you record the other character, you know, mm -hmm. so that's, I pulled that off. Eh. I wasn't good to me, but the good me won in the end. Mm -hmm. Then I did a thing called uh, uh, tons of other anime things. Um, but the, the main one that I enjoyed doing was uh, 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 Rory Kenshin, yep. which is also a, he did a Samurai X. And I was uh, Aoshi and um, then uh, in uh, Bleach, I was Mayuri Kuritsuchi, a yep. very bad man. He was, well, yeah, that's, that's one of my favorite characters to do. And uh, so I got into anime. I still did some commercials, but mostly it was anime and computer games. And then uh, movies, uh, do a lot of movies. I still do a lot of movie voice work. I direct a lot. I put loop groups together. You know what a loop group is? Yeah. Okay. So matter of fact, that's where I came from this morning was going in and uh, doing some voices, which is why I'm a little, little rough because I had to do some screaming and some yelling and stuff. It wasn't Call of Duty where you go in and you scream for a couple of hours and you can't speak for the next day or two. Right. But... Uh, I had a project I did this morning that when I got home, okay, no electricity, what the heck? Oh, wait, it never, never fails. So now I'm here in the, the club room with some of our wonderful historical things, because that's what I am. I'm a historical gamer, and I have been mm -hmm. since I used to own some stores in uh, in California here. I also paint, so I paint miniatures and stuff. It's something fun to do. Okay, yeah. Uh, Sometimes for Dungeon and, and Dragons people, sometimes a lot of, mostly historical stuff. Like there's something I painted right here. What the heck is that? Oh, that's cool. Right but then I'll also turn around and do things like this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Whatever people want me to paint, they pay me to paint them. I'll paint them. You know. But usually it's historical stuff. Here, wait. Mm hmm. Sometimes it's things that are very interesting, very different. Oh, yeah. That's cool, so though. This is an elephant from an Indian army. This mm. is a 28 millimeter. And, of course, it's lead. So it, I start with lead, and then I prime it, and I paint it up. Mm. So I used to have, uh, when I had the stores, I used to have a lot of clients that I would paint for here in the U.S. and, and also in, uh, in Europe. So anyway. That has nothing to do with voices. I'm just explaining why I'm in this wonderful setup and looks so good. Lovely lighting. Um, so from there, of course, uh, in the 2000, early 2000s, uh, this place called Blizzard decided to put a, a gaming empire together and they just started out. And so I was in the first group of uh, voiceover people that uh, were hired Back then, they didn't do credits, and I don't know what they do at all now still, but uh, I was, I've was i been in with Blizzard from the very beginning on uh, uh, World of Warcraft, Diablo, mm -hmm. Starcraft. Uh, didn't do that much Starcraft, mostly the uh, World of Warcraft, and of course, when Hearthstone started, um, I'm the main voice of the uh, tutorial and the, the face of the, the, the thing, the uh, little uh, dwarf, the, the Scottish dwarf. So um, mm. Stone has been kind of like the biggest thing that I continually do. Um, but like I'm directing a game right now, which I cannot say the name of yet. That's, uh, um, it's similar to when I direct Octopath Traveler, which okay. is um, for a, a mobile device. And I did a bunch of voices on that. So I, I just finished uh, directing that this morning, the final, final character I had for a cutscene video. It has about eight characters in there. It's a big, nasty battle, and I'm one of the characters. So I'm directing people this morning to scream hell and raise some hell, and then I had to go in and do a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. Death battle, death rattles and screams and war cries always blow your throat out. Right, yeah. <laughs> Why don't I be quiet for a second and let you actually ask me questions? <laughs> Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Obviously, I'm very shy. <laughs> So I just wanted to, because um, according to IMDb, like one of the first things that you, one of your first roles was uh, in the Charlie Chaplin movie with Robert Downey Jr. 
Oh, that was actually an on-camera thing. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed the heck out of that. Uh, what he did, what Sir Richard Attenborough did, being a former actor himself, he, uh, he was really good to work for in the first place. Mm. But he hired six of us to be reporters. Yeah. And uh, we were basically reporting. Every time you see a big press thing, whatever, um, we're in that crowd somewhere. And mm. we being union actors we could scream out lines and whatever he would say call out this call out that or he'd give us some stuff right before there was you know and then there might be an actor who was hired just for the day that came in to say his stuff but we were always the ones that were there and they you know change the way we looked and have a beard and have a bald head you know have a mustache all that kind of stuff yeah so I worked on that for a while and that was that was great because uh, Attenborough was great to work with but Downey Oh my God! Some of the best stuff that he did was in between takes that never even got on camera. Oh, he was yeah. he's just he's great. And of course, that was the time he was kind of still going through a little bit of stuff too. So, right. um, it was amazing to see how fun and talented he could be. And it's great that he's you know had such a great career now. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I I did some group stuff for Marvel's um, animated series What If. I don't know if it's out yet or not. But, uh, you know, uh, the, most of the stars did their own voice. So right. I'd, be, I'd be coming in with uh, putting a team together and do all the background characters and stuff. And one of them would be leaving, you know, Michael Douglas would be leaving or, you know, Chris or Tony. It doesn't matter. I mean, Tony, Robert. <laughs> you call them by their character or by their real name? What do you do, sir? <laughs> and I did some stuff on a thing called Scooby-Doo. Monster Unleashed, that was a lot of fun. I did a 10,000 volt monster and a bunch of stuff. That was a mixture of, you know, animation and CGI, of course. Um, acting, the first thing that I ever did as far as in front of the camera was a, uh, a mini series called North and South. And I played uh, Johnny Cash. You probably don't know who he is. Uh, he was a country singer. Yeah. There. Yeah. I can, uh, he played a, a abolitionist guy in the in the series with John Brown, and I played one of his sons. And we stop a train, and we're holding Patrick Swayze, and a bunch of them, uh, Kirstie Alley, we're holding them at gunpoint, you know, threatening them. Oh, and that's, stuff. that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So I started there, and then uh, uh, I I do a lot of on camera stuff uh, over the years, both the movies and TV. I've been a lot of TV series. So, mm -hmm. and then I was a stuntman. Stuntman for about eight years. So I've been working, you know, doing that, things like, well, anyway, that has nothing to do with voice stuff. <laughs> is that what you're mostly interested in is voice stuff, voice um, work? Well, yeah, I guess so. But I mean, I, I like to, um, if I see that somebody has roles in other um, areas and I like to ask about that too. Oh yeah, I've done kind of a lot of areas, I still do. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, actor, stuntman, um, TV, commercial, radio. Uh, now I still do some acting every now and then. Um, matter of fact, I did a thing uh, just this right before the pandemic hit where uh, I was supposed to have a recurring part in a uh, series that Adam McKay, who used to do everything with Will Ferrell, oh. um, he was putting together. It was called the, the Lakers Project Showtime because it was about Magic Johnson when he comes to the Lakers. And it may still happen, but we got shut down. Mm. But it's going to be on HBO, but it was called Showtime. So they went, okay, we're just going to, right now, work the unnamed Laker project. So yeah. I play a recurring part of uh, sort of the right-hand man of um, uh, the top agent at the time. So mm. that was going to be good when the pandemic hit. Yeah. So, But I still, I direct about half of the things that I do these days is directing uh, okay. for movies. I direct the people that come in to do their voices, voice replacement. Somebody's not available or they want to replace their voice, but they like the way they look on camera. So I'll either do it myself or I'll hire an actor or an actress to come in and completely revoice that character so that mm -hmm. you don't know that that's not their real voice, but mm -hmm. you're glad that you don't hear what they really sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, still do a lot of uh, computer games, tons of computer games, and of course things like Hearthstone that are ongoing for years now. What's it been since? 
Well, I think we had our five-year reunion. I mean, reunion. Uh, reunion, yes, we're all there, all the orcs. Um, anniversary, just last year or so. And uh, then, of course, World of Warcraft, we've been going since about 2002. IMDb, usually if you're going to see m most credits someone has, IMDb Pro has most of them. But the credits that show up for me on IMDb are about maybe two-thirds what I've done because a lot of things that you do, especially back in the, before the year 2000 or even 2005, you didn't always get a credit or sometimes you would not want a credit. So your name is never affiliated with the project, you know, and uh, some places, uh, computer games, things like that, up until 2015 or so, uh, a lot of them were not ever posting credits. You had to hunt to find out who did it. And of course, the reason that they started doing it is because fans would get voice actors confused with each other. Oh, that voice is so-and-so and so-and-so. And of course, the person who really did it was going, hey, no, no, that's not them. I did that. Right. I had a credit in, uh, in uh, Scooby-Doo Monsters Unleashed where I do the voice of the 10,000 volt monster. But because of political workings, there's also a credit to another voice actor who was friends with the producer oh. that he's listed on there too. He didn't have anything to do with the voice. So politics is kind of interesting in the in the entertainment business. I don't mean politics like the stuff that's going on today. No, I mean the inner workings of right. who you know and who knows you and all that kind of stuff. Just like an executive credit on a movie. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get an executive credit in the listings, you know. Hey, Chris, I'm doing a movie here. Uh, you have any uh, movie credits to your name? Why no I don't. I'll put your name in on this film I just finished here. <laughs> you'll be a producer or you'll be an executive. There you go. <laughs> a lot of times it doesn't mean anything. It's just doing favors or putting people in so they'll do you a favor later. <laughs> Hi, how you doing, Chris? <laughs> you can tell I also uh, teach and stuff because I'll get started and I'll just keep going. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> All right. But so... What else do you want to know? What do you want to know? You ask me. Okay. Well, you said that your first role in anime was Ray Earth. Um, that wasn't the first I did. I was with uh, Bang Zoom when they first started. There were a handful of us that really, like we were doing it when we very first started out of like a, a person's house or their mod uh, modified garage and studios there. Yep. So I did a lot of things for uh, Bang Zoom, a lot of... Uh, anime where I would come in and, and do a featured voice or a, a character for one episode or maybe two episodes. And when you go do a voice, you usually do a main voice. And then what you will do is two or three other smaller characters. Mm -hmm. And then if you're lucky, cause I like having fun, I like doing it. You'll do soldier B and uh, townsfolk a, you know, that have like one or two lines or three lines that are just fun. You know, right. so um, I'll there's so many shows that I would go in and guest voice or I would go in and just do one episode or games, do the same thing. And after a while, um, you, you just can't keep up with how much stuff there is and everything. And I I should be better about that since when I used to go to conventions, there's nothing worse than somebody coming up and asking you on the Q&A. What character, blah, 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 in episode, blah, 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 of show, blah, 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 why did you do, blah, blah, blah? And you're going, uh, hmm, that show, because uh, mm. uh, no fan wants to hear that you don't remember whatever character it is that they love mm -hmm. <laughs> or why you did something. Right. You know? So I started being better about keeping track of a lot of that stuff, depending on if I was going to an anime convention or a gaming convention or whatever. But, you know, um, there were, I don't know, because at the time you're trying to get in, break in, and so you do any job you possibly can um, on any show or movie or whatever. Right. So... 
when I first started. Plus, I was trying to establish myself in the main area of, you know, which is L.A., yeah. having come from the West. So you're literally doing anything. Hey, have Russian come. Can you do Russian? I do Russian accent. Yes, I go do. What was that character? No idea. I did a uh, uh, a thing uh, called uh, Black Hawk Down. It was yeah. One of the early ones that I did, where I'm the uh, Delta Force commander, and that was a lot of fun. That's a lot of screaming and yelling, <laughs> just like any Call of Duty thing. Um, heck. I don't, I don't remember some of the others. Sorry. Sorry. Ask me questions. I give you better answers. Am I a horrible interview so far? No. <laughs> Not even that good? Oh, man, Chris, you're so rough. <laughs> um, I did, yeah, I, Kenshin's one of my single favorite anime series. Yeah. So, um, Aoshi was fun. Aoshi was yeah. fun. To do. I did a bunch of other characters in that, but I really liked Aoshi. I've talked to um, Wendy and Dorothy, and they both said that. Uh, they both said that uh, that's actually one of the rare instances, rare instances with anime where you guys got together a lot to record. Yeah, yeah, I miss that because now, you know, you come in and we don't even do auditions like we used to now. I mean, mm -hmm. before, I mean, um, used to we'd come and. Uh, we'd all be, you know, in a studio. And while we're in the waiting room, um, we, would you know, see each other and talk and interact and all that kind of stuff. And then we'd go in one at a time and then come out and, you know, a couple of people come out, one waits for the other one. Hey, let's go have, you know, let's go have coffee, let's go have lunch, let's go whatever. Now you do it on your home computer, which of course, you know, because of the pandemic thing, everything's done that way on yeah. camera. For you know, I just did an audition. I sent in for a, a movie just uh, the other day. But you record them in your home. Um, a lot of us now have to have these home studios, which I probably would have done this from there, but with no power. <laughs> uh, kind of knock that out. But uh, we don't ever see each other because we send them in. We record them someplace by ourselves and send them in. And if they want, half the time we don't even go into a studio. Uh, right. during the first half of, well, no, up until about October of last year, nobody was going into studios. So everything was done virtually. Yep. So you don't ever meet anybody. You don't see anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we used to yeah, get together. We used to have groups that would get together and meet regularly or once a week or things like that. You know, can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, I regressed a little too far there. <laughs> My so voice what, is kind of tired too from all that screaming today. So, what, what, what were your thoughts on like Aoshi's character development and going through that? Well, of course, first he's he's just kind of this brute, and yep. you think, ah, what a jerk. And he does he does uh, give in to his you know his anger and things like that, and he's quick to anger. Um, or else he'll sit there and think about how he's going to take you out, you know, mm -hmm. but he comes around, especially towards the end there. And, uh, I really love, it was sort of like my Yuri, my Yuri also. I mean, you think he's just this horrible guy that he, he'll fight you. He'll beat you, but he doesn't want to kill you because I want to take you home and take you home and experiment on you. <laughs> yes. My Yuri Kuritsuchi. When I first did that, um, I have a thing where I can harmonize my own voice. Uh, if I warm up right, I can do three voices at the same time. Mm. Uh, usually I can do two. Of course, I don't know. But I went in for the audition for my Yuri. And um, so, you know, I was doing some of the stuff. And I was doing some of the stuff. And I put a little bit of the doubling in there. <coughs> I told you I've been screaming all morning. So I don't have all of it there right now. But when they sent the audition in, they sent back notes, which they do. And they said, love the voice, love the acting, love the attitude, but we don't need you to harmonize on the uh, track. Why did you put the harmonizing on there when you sent it to us? 
And we had to send back and go, no, that actually is what I was doing myself. Mm-hmm. And so they sent back, we don't know if we want that song. Okay. And then uh, we get another one a little bit later go, you know what? Now we think about that. No, we want that. And so I had it where it would come in and out, which made that voice just a little different than most characters that you do. Right. Uh, so anyway. I think Booker Man was the name of the first thing I ever did. I'm, I'm haunted by not being able to remember those things. Anyway. <laughs> Alshi, um, I love the, the big fight. The, you know, the, the fights with uh, Kenshin. Right, yeah. So that was, that was and uh, uh, Richard Cansino, who did uh, uh, right. We're, we're, we've been good friends and, and forever. You know, matter of fact, oh, yeah. I... I just hired him last week to do a, a live action voice thing for me to replace mm. a character. So, uh, but he was, he was good in that. Yeah. 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 That was a good old days, Chris. <laughs> do, you, do you ever see Mari Devon anymore? Mari? Uh, yeah. I haven't seen her in a while. We used to work together for a long time. Mm. Yeah. On, on lots of stuff. I used to hire her to do uh, loop group things with me and everything. Um, uh, matter of fact, I hired her just last year to come in and do a voice for a computer game I was directing. She may have done something on Octopath Traveler, but I don't think that was it. Anyway, um, why? What about Mari? Oh, I just thought that she was really underrated in terms of anime roles, too. That's a good point. Very yeah. underrated. Yeah. Yeah. She has a great voice, but she doesn't do a lot of uh, like wild characters or creatures yeah. or anything like that. So she's limited to more realistic creatures, but oh my mm-hmm. God, great voice. Are you kidding? And a great person too. She's, right. she's just really good. Um, sometimes you're lucky and you meet people. There was a guy named Bob Pappenbrook. Yeah. That, um, I used to do tons of stuff with, and I would also hire him a lot for uh, my loop groups. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had a son. And one day I said, you know, I need some kids, Bob. I need some kids. As a matter of fact, Mari has a daughter. She brought her daughter in and uh, Bob uh, brought in his son. And uh, he said, he's never done anything. I said, well, let's get him up there and, and get him broken in. So we started doing just some loop group stuff. And then I, I hired him to do a couple of other things. And he went on to be, uh, you know, Bryce Pappenbrook. So there you right. go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matter of fact, uh, I saw him. I was a special guest in Ireland for a convention a year or two ago, and um, Bryce was supposed to be there, and this other character guy was supposed to be there too, and they couldn't make it for some reason. And so uh, we did Skype back and forth back then, mm-hmm. and Bryce was on there, and so we, we regaled him for a while with silly stories of stuff when he was first starting out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So sometimes you, you get multi generations involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's fun. That's always cool when you can do that. <laughs> there's a, yeah, there's a, there's a decent amount of people I'd really like to talk to that aren't on social media, like Richard and Bridget Hoffman isn't at all. No, Bridget, no. Uh-uh. She, she doesn't <laughs> like it. No. Richard, uh, can, yeah, Richard Cansino doesn't. Uh-uh. Matter of fact, he doesn't hardly post anything. Richard's very cool. Uh, he's just uh, he's, he's his own person, you know, but he's, he's a lot of fun great personality just a great guy mm-hmm. um oh, i've always been a really big fan of uh brianne sadal too and she's not really yeah she's not really on anything either i had brianne actually come in and do a voice for me on this uh, computer game i'm directing now oh it's a computer game from china but brianne uh, has had uh, she's had a lot of fights with her health conditions fighting right. it you know and and yeah. really but she's, uh, she's a sweetheart. She mm-hmm. really is. But she came in, and uh, it's hard for her to do things now. But, boy, she, she keeps trugging, in, uh, trugging along and chugging along and uh, keeps trying to do whatever she can. And, and as always, whenever she does anything, it's usually just really good stuff. Right. Hmm. So, yeah, Brianne. Saw her a few weeks ago. Were you, were you close with uh, Michael Lindsay? Not close. I mean, we all kind of know each other, and some of us really know each other pretty well. Mm-hmm. But some people, you just don't cross their paths that much. Because think about it, if you don't socialize a lot, um, 
the only time you're going to see them is on a job. And now it's, it's rare that they do groups anymore, especially right. now can't do it. Uh, I did a loop group for a film the other day and, you know, we had six people in there and they were spread all over the place with masks and everything. So you don't get together with people very much. And so if you don't run across them, you don't have a way to really get to know them much, but mm. didn't really, uh, didn't really know him. Yeah. Okay. Didn't know him much. Huh? So I can go back to, um, I think another, yeah, after Kenshin and Ray Earth, another one of your big roles would have been an X. Ah, yeah, Samurai X. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's a bunch of good stuff back then. Or, I meant the, I meant the, the actual series just called X. Oh, the series X. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that was, that was wild. I think Richard was in that too. We did a weird thing too uh, with X. I think it was X that we did two times. Mm -hmm. We did a version that we recorded that they put out that uh, Richard Epcar and Michael Sorich co-directed it. Mm -hmm. And then a few years later, we did it all over again with the, the, a different group for a different, it's very interesting, which is fine, you know. What? I have to come in and do some work on something I already like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> The weird thing is when you do a voice and then years later you get called in, you don't even have to audition. You know, most of the stuff I do, I don't have to audition for. It's just right. body of work. They just call you because they're used to hearing what you've done or they heard something and liked it. So you have to be careful and kind of keep a little library because they'll call you in and say, yeah, you did a voice on this thing thing and I really like that. And then that's what we want you to do now. Uh, you have a voice sample? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, you don't remember it? Off the top of your head? No, I don't. But luckily with YouTube, you can go to, you know, whatever the, the thing was and pull up the character. And usually you, you can get that. Um, you can pull it up and you can find it. But yeah, right. you, you just don't remember all the characters you do. Which, like I say, go to an anime convention and not know the character or the plot that the person's asking you about or whatever on the panel. And then you're kind of, Ah, uh, this is egg, and it's on my face, and I don't know. In front of twenty thousand people, great. <laughs> well, you had a you had a one of a kind of a bigger role in Chobits. Do you remember that? Oh yeah, Chobits. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, I've forgotten about Chobits. <laughs> I think Wendy Wendy, uh, Wendy was on that, and uh, wasn't she? Wasn't Wendy Lee on that? Yeah, and Sandy Fox and yeah, oh Sandy Fox, oh my God, she's awesome. <laughs> you talk about the sweetest person in the world, and that's Sandy. Right. Very positive, very sweet, and and her voices are always pretty fun. Mm -hmm. She's good. Yeah, yeah, I love Sandy. Yeah. I'm got this might be obvious, but do you have more of a preference working on like darker, serious anime in terms of lighter shows? I like the bad boys, the evil characters. Uh, the heroes are fine and the good guys, but usually you're limited in your range. Of course, you've heard this a million times, of course, mm -hmm. because you have to be something solid that everything else bangs against or the water flows around as the bad guys. And that's where, and the bad guy has to be, you know, pretty big. Yeah. But, um, uh, half of the things that I do are uh, creatures. Yep. Uh, like one of my um, newly very popular characters with Hearthstone is a thing called Sir Finley Mergleton. And he's a fish man. Mm. And he's a, he's a creature, you know. But, uh, uh, well, look at my Scottish dwarf, you know, Hearth Stonebrew, the main guy there. He's a dwarf, but mm. he's a fantasy dwarf. Yeah, uh, and I don't do anything from orcs and dragons and stuff to the other, and those are more fun, of course, because you you get to just play and be wild and be crazy, whereas the others you have to you know, I'm solid, I'm a warrior, I'm the good guy, I am the wise one, I am the one that you come to, you know, mm. instead of I am the one that'll kill you. Well, that's kind of a little different flavor, you know, but it's a lot more fun. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So the bad. The dark side 
the dark side. <laughs> Luke. Um, they're more fun because you have more layers. You have more, you can play more, you know. With me, they, they have to rein me in sometimes. It's like, oh my God, that's okay. Come back, come back. You've, you've gone off the reservation. <laughs> Was it just really natural for you to work on Digimon then too? Oh, Digimon. Oh, that's one of the first ones I did. That's right. Oh, I did a bunch of characters on Digimon. Um, Digimon was fun because that's when we were still doing groupings. Yep. And uh, we did it down uh, right there next to the uh, UCLA campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh my God, that was always fun. Um, I was also involved in a lot of the loop groups for Digimon back then. You would do that now. Yeah. What you do is each character person that comes in after they finish their character, then they'll give you a bunch of wild lines and you just mix after 10 people have been in, you mix them all together and sound like there were 10 people there. Mm -hmm. But back then we would, we would be together a lot. And Digimon is where I, I met most of the voiceover community, if you want to call it that okay. for a lot of years from the uh, late eighties until right up to the late nineties. Um, there were maybe 25, 30 max of us that did most of the work on all that stuff right. here in LA. And most of us, it was like 20 and less of us that did a lot of work because we had a lot of variety. I have a four and a half, well, four and a half, I have a three and a half octave uh, singing range, vocal oh, range. Okay. So I can go from very low, you know, low up to really, really high. Yeah. And I have a very strong, since I started out as a singer, I have a very strong falsetto. Mm. And so uh, there's a, there's tons of characters in that arc there that I can do, you know? So I was able to get a lot more work and all kinds of different kind of work mm -hmm. uh, because I can go so many different places. Um, right. So I got to work with, the thing that's fun is to work with as many different studios as you can mm -hmm. because you get to know the people at the studios or to always, always great people in the layout and stuff. And then uh, the major studios, you know, Warner, Disney, all the universe, all that kind of stuff when you work for them. Um, I enjoy doing that more because it's kind of like something's always different. You're always going to a different place. You're working with different people. You're meeting different people and you're able to do tons of different projects you right. know, instead of being assigned to just, you know, a handful of things that take up all your time and you can't really do anything else. Mm -hmm. But having that, that range allows me to do so many different characters. But a lot of them are creatures or dark characters. Yeah, I don't get asked to do the heroes much because we've got so many great guys that that's exactly what they do, you know. Yeah. And they've got the big deep pipes where they've, they've just, that's their specialty. When you're doing voice work, just like if you're doing on-camera work as an actor, you find out what is what. What are your strong suits? What do you know that if I go in there, I deserve to be in this room? Yeah, because this is the stuff that I do well. Instead, uh, instead of people saying, "Oh, I do everything. I do anything," it's the last thing a casting director wants to hear because everybody says they do everything. Mm -hmm. But um, my thing is, there are a lot of things that I I don't want to go into a, an audition knowing that I really, I can be there. Like they say, they want a Scottish accent. Well, I nail a Scottish accent. Uh, I grew up partially with one being around me. Mm -hmm. So if I walk in the room, I know I deserve to be there. But if I'm there and they're also auditioning five other guys from Scotland, well, <laughs> okay. I think they might know how to do it a little better than me since yeah. they're the real thing. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes just because you can do something doesn't mean you, uh, you're you the best at it. It may not be a, a really strong suit of yours. So if you know what your strengths and what your limitations are, then you understand, here's what I need to focus on. Try to do these roles. Try to do these characters. Try to do that kind of thing instead of just being all over the board. Mm. I don't know why we got into casting situations all of a sudden there. Except I used to be a casting director too. And voice wise, I still am because yeah. I have to. I have to cast all the time for people. Um, when I was working with uh, Caitlin McKenna on uh, Wind Talkers and uh, and a couple of other things, where you've got to find 
accents or you've got to not accents you've got to find actual languages yep. finding uh, the navajo for wind talkers being union actors that knew how to do voice work that took forever oh yeah but i also when i was uh i was working at a studio where we did a lot of the weinstein stuff their library in uh 2016 2017 before things went really weird there and uh I did, in one year, I did 84 of their library, in other words, movies that you could get that had been done within the last year or sometimes as they were being done. Mm -hmm. And I would direct the Spanish version, the Italian version, the German version, you know. I would direct all those versions yeah. of the, the movie. And so I would have to find the uh, people that were from there that spoke it fluently that also spoke English fluently, that knew how to do voiceover work and how to do looping. Right. And I'd have to find them and then pull them together and, and hire them to come in and do stuff and then direct them, you know, and things. So what you do is the key is always have a technician who's running the recording yeah. while you're directing and the technician's here and make sure that they speak fluently, whatever language you're recording in. <laughs> And hire actors that are also fluent in English. That way you can still direct, even though you don't speak the language. Mm -hmm. But I would all, always learn at least uh, conversationally or the the basics of any language that I direct in. Right. It's, yeah. It's also, it's also a good thing to just to, to know, you know, learn stuff. Mm -hmm. Anyway, like right now, Chinese, when I do this computer game I'm working on now, um, and we always work at night because that's their morning. Yeah. You know? And so my technician, my recording engineer, he is Chinese from China. Been here quite a while. His English is wonderful. But there's that delay if they don't speak English for them to tell him what their notes are. Then he mm -hmm. translates them to me. Then I translate them to the actor. Then back and back and back. So it's like, eh, takes a few steps to get it there. And now I'll be quiet. What can I, uh, what can I answer for you, sir? I was going <laughs> to, because I, I actually grew up a lot with the Dynasty Warriors games. And um, yeah, when did you start yeah. to notice that, like, I don't know, the kind of iconic, uh, I don't know what the word is, but like uh, with the, with Zhao Yun being kind of like the main face of the series. Um, yeah, that was weird. Um, he was... One of he was a main character when we first recorded it and yeah. did the first one, and for some reason the fan base liked him, his weapon, and according to response for quite a few years that they liked my my take on him. Mm. Um, they it was weird at first recording on that because they would have us do sort of not stilted performances, but they were very kind of rigid in their directing of how how they wanted us to do it you know I, I couldn't just say I'll take my spear and hold them off over there no I had to go I will take my spear and hold them off over there it was kind of like yeah you know, right stiff almost but that's the way they wanted us to sound because they wanted it to sound like that time period a little yeah. different so it didn't sound like people just from today but as it went along, you know, some of the fan base went, oh, my gosh, these voice actors, they sound like they're so stuffy. They sound so stiff and everything. But uh, I guess it was by the second the second expansion we did, or whatever you want to call them, version, uh, that uh, they started putting his face on the cover bigger. Right. Then I guess by the third one or, or – Somewhere in there, he became the face. He was like the, the face of the character. He always, oh, Zhao Yun. And it, and it kind of went from Zhao Yun to Zhao Yun. And so he was always flashy. Uh, he was, one, you know, good looking like most of them. But he had that, that spear. His spear was pretty nasty. It was pretty fun. Mm. And all of a sudden, he became this popular character. I always loved playing him because he was, you, you knew you could always trust him. You knew he was loyal. And uh, uh, he was he was valiant. He was brave. You know, um, he didn't turn on. He didn't have really an ulterior motive other than to to do something work worthy. Mm -hmm. You know, and so I always always liked that character. And then they changed a couple of years ago. Out of the blue, they got in touch with us, 
and we were going to do another version after it hadn't nothing been done for a long time. Yeah. And then they sent back a communication to us and said, Oh uh, no, we're rewriting. So we're going to put you on hold. We'll be back with you later. And we never heard back from them. All of a sudden this new version came out and they had gone in and recast everybody. Oh. And it's like, okay. And uh, so it was, the fan base did not respond well to that. Right. For most of the characters. Matter of fact, I think they also didn't really like the, the, the story, storyline and just, just a bunch of stuff. They just didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And so they, uh, they brought a bunch of us back on the next, they did one more version, but I didn't do Zhao Yu and I, I forget who I did, but I did two totally different characters that I'd never done before. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's like, okay, <laughs> but I don't, you know, I don't sound now like I did in the nineties. Okay, fine. Were you born? So anyway, yes, I'm old. So <laughs> you have to keep living to get old. So I'm going to just keep doing that. It's okay with you. I think it's especially interesting when, um, like people like you and Kirk Thornton have hero, oh, Kirk. Yeah. have hero roles like that because it's, I'm so used to hearing you guys in you know darker. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Kirk, Kirk is very. He's a very good director, which I'm sure mm-hmm. you probably know. And mm-hmm. it's interesting out here. There are some of us that have been around for so long that, uh, you know, next week I may be working for Kirk. The week mm-hmm. after that, or later that same week, I may have him in, and he's working on something for me. Yep. And then another day, somebody else may use both of us on their project. And all we we're just hired guns. We don't have anything to do with directing, and so it's it's fun that it's that way. You can uh, those of us that have been in the business long enough, or <laughs> a long time, <laughs> uh, we built up to where we can see each other and work with each other by being hired or hiring back and forth across the way. There mm-hmm. were sometimes in the '90s where if I was putting a loop group together, a lot of times what I would do would be call other loop group directors and bring them in. And so we'd be a bunch of loop group directors doing the group. Yeah. And then one of them would have one and they do kind of the same thing. And for a while, you know, that's kind of the way it was. Right. Or uh, when we first started and we, you know, a lot of people with Barbara Harris or uh, uh, LA Mad Dogs or just, you know, there were different main group people back then, but there weren't very many of them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us that worked, in those loop groups as hired soldiers, we learned what we were doing then. And then we split off and became loop group leaders later. So right. it's very funny how you start from, I'd like to do anything on this show. I don't care. I'll do the voice of garbage man. Number three, could I just work on it to then one day? Oh, I'm actually casting this project. I've got 60 characters. I'm also directing it. So, hey, uh, you know, it's a little, little different. <laughs> so going, going to bleach to, um, your your handle of Mayuri is actually pretty similar to the Japanese, so is that what you were told to do? No. No, they didn't really tell us anything. Uh, sometimes we would have the original Japanese as a reference for maybe uh, how intense mm. or how loud on something, um, because maybe the translation was kind of, well, now, wait a minute. I, I get these words, but... Because, uh, see, a lot of times... Um, you well, no, usually you don't hear what the other characters have recorded that your your oh, character yeah. might be talking to when you're in there. It, it, we used to do that. We used to have a thing where if someone had recorded before you, then they would play that into your headphones while you were, you know, so you could hear. Oh, that's how they said it. So now I know I need to be more emotional or. I thought they would be madder when they said that, but what they decided to use is he's, he's not that mad. So I need to tone my tone the response down, you know, mm-hmm. but then you have a lot of problems with that bleeds over into the beeps. Cause you know, we, we usually work with beeps right. most of the time. And if you're playing something else over it, then you lose the beeps and you still don't, you don't know when to start. So sometimes they would play it so we can hear it once. And then we, they take it out of our headphones. In other words, just same thing as when you're, revoicing someone 
a lot of times you can leave it in the cans, they call it, which means I'm hearing the voice saying it when I'm trying to match it. And yeah. the reason that helps is because sometimes you can follow along and it helps you get, since I come from music and a lot of, a lot of voiceover people have either music or yeah, some kind of a music background or affinity for it. And so timing tempo, you know, maybe the, the guy goes, I don't want to do that. So it, that means da 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 da. I don't want to do that. Da 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 da. So now I've got the tempo down. And um, so when we do it, I'm going as much off of the beeps of the tempo that I've heard of their rhythm, you know. And so uh, uh, sound alike is different than voice replacement. Sound alike, you're trying literally to sound just like what they sound like. Right. And that works great unless there were some lines that the original actor forgot to get. So, you know, you've got to recreate these additional lines that are like you don't see their mouth or they're off screen or something, but you've got to sound just like them. So mm -hmm. I'm a mimic. I'm not an impressionist. Uh, so what that means is you bring me into the studio. I put the headphones on. I hear the voice, the lines that I'm supposed to say, mm -hmm. and I hear them and I mimic them just like trying to do a song, trying to learn a song. The song is da 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 da, and I'm going da 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 da. No, that's not quite it. Keep working, keep working, then I get it right. Mm -hmm. Mimicking's the same thing. I hear it until I sound like it. I mimic them, and then 30 minutes later, you know, you could come up and say, "Hey, what'd you work on this morning? Oh, I worked on this thing. Oh, who'd you do? Oh, this so and so star. Oh yeah. Oh, how, did it go well? Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Well, let me hear some. Do some of it. And you went, I got nothing, because I have to hear it to mimic it. Whereas an impressionist, they've got it in their head and they can pull it up anytime. I always, I was always jealous of that. People that can do that, that's really a great talent to just be able to do it anytime you want. But if I hear it, I can change, find out where the front of the mouth, back of the mouth, nasal, what are they doing? And I can sound like most people. There's some that I just can't, of course, but only while I'm hearing them. Then you walk away and I got nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyway, how do we get on that? What was your what was your uh, hardest part or like your hardest scene? Do you, if you can remember to record with Mary? Um, we did the movie, um, and he is he's kind of at the bottom of the barrel. He's in a cell, and uh, it's one of the few times we get to see what he really looks like. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's that was just such a huge emotional scene, and uh, that that was hard because it's it's interesting. You start to identify personally with your characters if you do them for very any, any length of time at all, and you start to care about them. We had a guest director that came in one time, which I won't say who, that was going to direct me doing some Mayuri stuff, and. Uh, she wanted me to do a different delivery and she kept trying to give me line readings and say, no, 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 I'll give me this, give me this. And I would say, no, sorry, but that's not my Yuri. That's not the way he would say this. That's not how I would do that. Mm -hmm. and she's going, well, but that's different. I want this. And I go, that's the whole thing of my Yuri. My timing was on purpose to be a little different. It was almost not sing-songy, but it was almost uh, Shakespearean in the way I'd, I would like weave it around. He had a flow and he, he was, he sort of flowed through things instead of just abruptly being there. So she got mad at me and we took a break and she went off and complained to the uh, producer and the producer told her, well, he knows the character. He created the way he's doing it. So if he has a problem with that, then you should pay attention to that. And so without meaning to, I kind of won an argument I never tried to, to have. Mm -hmm. And she left me alone on the thing. But you you just know, no, that's not the way Mayuri would do this. He's right. not going to say that. He's not going to this. He's not going to that. And you identify with them. And so when they go through something emotional, which, you know, I mean... Um, Nemi, oh my gosh, he used to just be so horrible to her, you know, mm -hmm. he was horrible to her and she was just so devoted. 
And uh, I hated that about him. Mm-hmm. But I like that they let that change. They let that art change a little bit. Right. But yeah, in the in that movie, in that uh, the the jail cell, the prison, that whole scene. That was a very emotional scene, anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that was that was the strongest, hardest thing that I ever did for him. There's a speech that's on YouTube and and uh, you know about perfection. You yeah. Know? And it's it's interesting. A lot of people love that speech, and I loved it. You know, as far as what it said. And everything but i actually did that in, in one take oh I did, an, I did another take for safety because you always you know get a safety and just in case you something hits you differently yeah but i read that and usually you you have it broken up into lines because it was a lot of dialogue and it's broken up into like sections okay and you do a section that's three or four lines and if there's a natural place that you might take a pause or take a breath then they skip and you've got the rest of the lines there and you take it in sections if it's a lot of stuff Mm-hmm. because usually you kind of have to but for some reason i was just really really in tune with everything my Uri that day and i read through the speech one time ahead of time and i just for some reason i just said leave it open which means you know don't don't stop at the place where it's designed to stop mm-hmm. leave it open and let me let me just try this all the way through the first time yeah and it was all there, exactly the sink, everything. Um, and I did the whole thing in, in one take, and it was a lot of stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And that was, I was proud of being able to do that, but it also, that was an emotional time. Because right. um, this is, you know, this was sort of like his mantra, in a way. Yeah. As far as what he thought about perfection. It's like, oh, okay. But I get a lot of stuff about that. And it's just mm. weird the way, it, the way it happened. Mm-hmm. What was your what was your what was your approach to uh, voicing uh, Yoruichi's cat form too before she was <laughs> real? <laughs> well, he's a cat, so he's not going to be able to give you a lot, and he's a black cat, so you're not going to see a lot of facial anything. So I just went. This is a wise uh, creature in mm-hmm. this platform so it just he just happens to be in a cat of course boy when i make the transition <laughs> i couldn't play that part <laughs> Woo, she was she was hot yeah but uh yeah just as the cat because when he first started out you saw him you know that way and it's like take your time you know be wise if you're trying to tell someone something to teach them something mm-hmm. then you take your time you go slower because what you're saying they're having to process and understand it. And if you go too quickly, then you give them overload. But if you take your time or, and you're calm and everything else, it provides a, an atmosphere for them to hear you and understand you and, and learn whatever you're trying to teach or tell. Mm-hmm. So pretty much that was the approach on that. Okay. And then another one of your big uh, sort of anti hero roles is in Sayuki, is Kogaiji. <laughs> You like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get to play some some fun ones every now and then that you just enjoy. Um, like in the Bobo Bobo Bo. Yeah. Right. One of the most fun characters I had was the service guy. He's just a sheet and he comes around and he flashes every now and then. <laughs> yeah. Same thing. Service <laughs> He rushes <laughs> off. You know. But but yeah, um getting back to the character you're talking about. Um some characters are just fun to play. And uh, even if they're serious or they're evil, you know, they're fun because you put those little nuances in there. Or some of them are just wild and crazy and, and stuff. And so you get these little jewels every now and then. And that was, that was a nice one. I did uh, uh, Edward III, who is a, I guess he's a lizard in, uh, oh, uh, beautiful joe oh yeah uh, yeah the series i didn't do the computer game uh, right. but i did i did him in the series so he was different because i harmonized my voice a lot on him and he was evil and stuff but the thing i enjoyed about doing uh beautiful joe is there were these creatures called bianchis mm-hmm. like all these robot things like minions so what i did i did all the bianchis i would lay down a track and then I'd have them play that to me and I'd harmonize a 
above it. And then they'd play both of them and I'd harmonize above that or below that or whatever. And I always tried to do harmonies that when you played them all together, it had this kind of weird chord that sounded cool, but you weren't really sure. It didn't do exactly what you expected it to. Mm-hmm. And so you get some fun stuff like that too, every now and then. Um, I don't know why I went there. I haven't thought about that character in a long time. Edward the <laughs> Third. Anyway, or was it Edward or Charles? I don't remember. I didn't, More questions. I didn't know that you were on um, one of the Samurai Warriors games too. Oh yeah, several of them. Okay. Oh yeah. 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 And guest voicing on uh, different characters and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of times, again, you don't know stuff that we have done mm-hmm. because we either don't take a credit at all or they don't give credits right. or um, sometimes you'll be working. It happens a lot if you're working for a major studio mm-hmm. and you're doing a series of something for them and then a competing show wants to hire you to do something. Yeah. So you do the job, but you don't take the credit. Right. Say, okay, I'll, I'll do this uncredited, no credit. Okay, and don't even list me as a no credit because sometimes they'll show up, no credit. But then your name's still affiliated with it. And so the other side goes, hey, what are you doing working for our competition? Hey, you know, mm-hmm. it used to be like that really badly, uh, you know, in the early, like the 90s and early 2000s. Yep. So you would do something, you would just take no credit. I don't want my, my name to show up in the credits. So right. that's why I say IMDb only has, you know, so much stuff. And there are a lot of us like... Um, that can do union and non-union. Uh, I'm a, a status with, with SAG called the uh, financial core, FICOR. Okay. Yeah. So I, I had to do that years ago because I started directing and some of the directing I would do would be for non-union stuff because I knew the, I knew the actual main director or the producer and they wanted me to come in and do this, you know, work for them. So I can come in as an individual if I'm FICOR and SAG doesn't care. But, but then again, you know, everybody I hire has to be non-union. Mm-hmm. But I took that designation and I just never have changed it back. And uh, a bunch of us did during one of the horrible strikes we had back then. We had one that lasted almost a year. You know, it was oh, sort of yeah. like the pandemic, only it was a strike. So yeah. it, only, it only applied to SAG after people. And that was before SAG and after had joined together. Mm-hmm. And so um, uh, there are uh, sometimes... Uh, Maybe it's a non-union project, but it uh, it's something that is competing with a SAG project I've done or something. So again, you just don't take a credit or you know have yourself officially um, associated with it. Not that you didn't like the project, you just you know. And IMDb usually deals mostly with union type credits. Yeah. So if you're going to put anything on there that was a non-union, you have to go on personally to IMDb and and put in there, you know, what the credits are and what they were called. IMDb is interesting sometimes. They screw up. Um, they had me just out of the blue. I was supposed to be married to a French woman that I had never heard of this person before. No idea who it is. Tried to track this person down to find out how in the world they got posted to my IMDb that I was a married to this person. Oh, so I went in and I had to, I had to send letters and email and all kinds of stuff. And they finally, I said, I don't know this person. I don't, I'm not married. I don't know. Nah, 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 nah. And so instead of taking her out completely, they just switched it over to divorced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not divorced. I don't even know who the person is. And they wouldn't, I don't, it may still be under. They took it off for a while, but I think it may be back on there that this woman who I have no idea who she is, is divorced from me. <laughs> so IMDB has uh, some weird things that they do every now and then. You never really know. Right. Do you remember being uh, this uh, more of a more of an obscure one? It's just a one episode of it's an OVA called Fake. Oh, Fake. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't. I wasn't sure if you'd remember that. <laughs> well, um, now with Fake. Wasn't I one of the two leads? Yeah, it was you and Lux Lang, I think. No, I think it was Doug Stone. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was Doug Stone 
and I, which we're not related, but we always say that we go and we go. And this is uh, whenever I hire Doug, I go, this is Doug Stone, not related. When he hires me, I go, this is Terrence Stone, not related. Uh, so they don't think we're trying to play, you know, family favorites or stuff. And also then it just, just became a fun joke for us. Um, I hired Doug just, uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but yeah, um, I think that the two leads were lovers. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, fake. <laughs> we did that for Bang Zoom. That was one of the early things we did for Bang Zoom. Right, and uh, yeah. oh, we had a lot. Of, we had a lot of fun with that. Oh God, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Doug and I are crazy when you get us together. Anyway, um, but yeah, on that one especially. Oh yeah, fake. I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was the first fun co-lead that I had. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the first full lead that I had, and then for it to be Doug, the two, the Stone Boys, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. Wow, man, you are going back. Look at you. It was, yeah. yeah, it was you and it was you guys, and it was Steve Staley and Mona Marshall, and well, a lot of them were just starting out and just kind of getting established and everything. Oh, yeah. Mona Marshall's great. Yeah. yeah. Well, like I say, there was a a small grouping of us that uh, about mm. that time, either were working, and we pretty much were always working on almost everything. Under yes. sometimes under different names, you know, like some of my stuff. I'm uh, some things I'm even listed as Robert Stone or Terry Stone or yeah. uh, oh I forget um, something else I've used, uh, and so that's happened off and on, lots, doesn't anymore. But um, some of the ones that are strong now, uh, we're just coming in then, right? You know, we're just getting started. And uh, it was that was, those were good times because it was a good core, and you're always glad to see each other. And uh, we we stayed connected a lot more then. But that a lot of us didn't have you know extended families or big families or other mm-hmm. things going on. Fake. <laughs> you. <laughs> what else have you found? This is fun. Oh <laughs> uh, well, there were a lot of other ones around that time that you were did uh, just random voices for like uh the lupin series and uh, oh Lu- <laughs> Lupa. yeah lupin or lupin uh matter of fact they just redid it richard just did that again and i wasn't available to do anything on it and so i didn't get to work in the uh, the the cast again but they just uh, put out another version of that that the bunch of the originals had a lot of fun doing and everything right so yeah stuff. yeah that and uh, bobo bobo bo and uh Oh my gosh, a bunch of wild, crazy, silly little animes that we did during that time. Oh my God. And of course, you know, Naruto and some of those, you know, I, I've guest voiced somewhere at some time on pretty much most of them. Right. Um, sometimes with the credit, sometimes you would never know unless, you know, we just found it and heard it or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, it's fun to work with the different casts and things like that too right uh, and then a lot of uh i directed a few years ago uh, the new spy kids series the animated series mm-hmm. and uh then i also directed for uh, dreamworks um the uh where's waldo mostly for kids right and it's an animated series also and the fun thing about that is of course you have a lot of celebrities coming in and doing guest voicing or uh, you know, a, a two episode character or something like that. And I enjoy the heck out of uh, either live, you know, live films and TV shows or anime or, or movies, things like that. I enjoy uh, directing celebrities and stuff. They're, oh, they're a lot. Yeah, that's, that's a huge amount of fun. Um, some of them I already know anyway, but then others come in and, and you get to, to see what they're like, just normal people. Cause usually when they're doing voiceover stuff, and they're on camera stars, that's not their strongest suit. Right. And some of them, you know, it intimidates them a little bit, or they're not really good at it, but they, they come, they're in a different element than they're comfortable with. Mm-hmm. And so it's fun to put them at ease and work with them and pull stuff out of there and make it fun for them, because then that also helps them, you know, have really good stuff. And a lot of times they're doing an anime movie or TV show or something because, Oh, my kids, I love seeing blah, blah, blah. My grandkids, my grandkids, I love seeing me on this. 
So you get a kick out of helping them pull out the best performance they can give and make it a fun experience for them. Some people on movies, they come in and they're going to do their ADR stuff and uh, they hate it because they're trying to sync things then. When you're doing animated series, a lot of times you're recording the voices first and then right. they're doing the animation to it afterwards. Well, that's, that's original animation. I mean, original voice stuff. That's always the best because you're creating it. You know, yeah. then it's just a matter of finding the performance, make sure you've got the voice and stuff, you know. And uh, so it's a lot of fun. You never know. You never know what you're going to get. It's like a box of chocolates. Were you, um, this is kind of random, but were you very close with, uh, before she moved back to Canada, were you very close with Lenora Zahn? Not close. No. Uh, okay. Again, people that you know, you know a little bit of or about, um, but no. Mm -mm. no. Okay. Well, everything I ever heard though was always good, you know. Yeah. Always positive. Very good. I wish I had. Yeah. Sounds like a person that I would really have enjoyed knowing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, you never get to, and that's that's the sad part of it. Right. Um, yeah, well, I was going to ask too. What out of all the anime characters, who do you think that you're most like, or that you can like relate to the most? Wow. <laughs> mm. well better not say my <laughs> <laughs> oh. wait excuse me the police are at my door thank you how'd you know I was here I, this is in my home <laughs> anyway um, that's a good question mm. very good question no he's waiting for a good answer <laughs> you know what um in a lot of ways, um, Zhao Yun for uh, like, like a computer thing, and Aoshi. Yep. Um, because uh, I come from, uh, I, I didn't have a mother, and so I was raised by my grandparents while my mm -hmm. father was in the military, and then he was, uh, he was uh, just going into coaching after he, you know, then he went to college and he was became a coach so I was raised by two pairs of grandparents one Irish grandparents which is where I learned Scottish and Irish and all this kind of stuff and then my my father's grandparents so a lot of the ways I understood and learned things early on was not from my father's generation the generation you know before me but two generations before me and so a lot of uh, the ideals I had you know like uh, tell the truth uh if you give your word stand by it you know mm -hmm. um don't be friends with somebody to their face and then stab them in the back or when somebody else you know behind their back you don't take up for them you're not loyal to them right. uh, you know a lot of the old values i guess you'd say that probably seem a little silly to some people these days but those two characters um you know they have that yeah. And that always resonated, even though Aoshi had his problems and stuff. A lot of the bad about Aoshi as it develops a storyline is because of what he's dealing with and what's right. happened, you know, and what he's trying to, to hold together. Mm -hmm. And his sister, you know, the whole thing there. Uh, so some characters handle it well, like Zhao Yun. And then some of them have to struggle a lot with it, like Aoshi, you know. Um, and so I had to do that um, I had to kind of grow up not having a family focus or center. And then I left home when I was 16. So eh, that was interesting. So I had to learn a lot of stuff on my own and uh, by myself. You know, I didn't have anyone there saying, let me teach you how to do this or tell you how to do this. So most of anything I had that helped shape or develop who I was and my belief system as far as how to treat people and interact with people was from my grandparents, you know. Mm -hmm. So those values and those attitudes ring true with Xiao Yun and, and Aoshi the most. Okay. Yeah, so I'd have to say that. Yeah. That's cool. Um, I guess the last thing I could ask you would just be like, what do you want your legacy to be? Uh, in relation to voiceover work? Yeah. Well, actually, it could be, it could apply to anything, actually. Um, 
to now this is in general like a life thing or something it pertains to doing voices um just i guess in terms of like how you want old like old fans or new fans that discover your work and yeah like anime or whatever like what do you want them to um I like appreciate or oh i see i see okay yeah, yeah. i just want to be with answering what you really wanted to know mm -hmm. um the main thing is that when they hear any character that i've done that they that it's enjoyable to listen to that they believe it you know mm -hmm. Instead of just, oh, that's just such a silly voice or whatever. That's just stupid. That the characters that I create seem real, mm -hmm. whether they're a, a fish man or a snail or a, you know, a hero warrior or, a, you know, a, an elf or it doesn't matter, whatever it is, that you believe what you're hearing or what mm -hmm. you're seeing, you know, what, that it, it seems genuine, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, want it to be real even when you're doing anime and you're kind of over the top or even cartoons and things like that that you just go right along with that character you buy into it you know you enjoy whatever the performance is yeah and uh and you have to if you're going to actually find any of those characters redeemable that you want to like them or care about them like my scottish dwarf for a uh, uh, Hearthstone. Um, he's friendly. He's welcoming. Um, he always is positive, you know. So when you hear anything that he does there, not only is he helping you, but he also, uh, I'm, I'm making you feel, ma making what you're doing, watching or playing, fun. Right. If it can be fun for you and enjoyable for you, then I've done my job. You know, mm -hmm. I've, and I've also not just my job. It's it's what I want to get across. Yeah, you know, I want you to enjoy it. I want you to remember any of them that touch you in a certain way. But I would like a lot of the characters to touch you in some way, mm -hmm. either make you mad or make you sad or make you happy, make you feel good or make you go, wow. I don't know if I want to meet that guy. And he's gonna take me home and experiment on me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is that a answer for what you were asking yeah that yeah that, that's good okay all right yeah because i always have fun when i do them i always if i go to the studio i make it fun you know always be something that anybody when they're going to work with you they look forward to seeing you coming because they know it's going to be fun time mm -hmm. and when you hear what my work has done characters or whatever that is fun that you right. enjoy it. Mm -hmm. yeah. well thanks for going to do this Oh, you kidding? Thank you for asking, Chris. Very much. <laughs> Sorry about the uh, the the power outage thing. Oh, it's funny. always when you don't need it to be. So anyway, I'll be sure to send uh, you. I'll be sure to send it to you once I get it up on YouTube. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, it's very nice meeting you virtually. Yeah, you too. <laughs> All right, you take care of yourself. And uh, uh, anytime I hear anybody saying they're going to be on with Chris, I'll say, Oh yeah, you got to be on with him. He's great. <laughs> Okay.